thanks, Dr. Marley, for the kind introduction. Um, and uh, I hope I can make this work. Um, do I have to just click to move it? Okay, okay, sure, sure, sure. Yep, so um, first of all, uh, thank you very much, um, Foundation Meru, for the invitation, Valentina, Marianne, and the team, and Bigsby, Mom Nancy, um, Mom Timmy, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great feeling to be part of a face-to-face -face meeting once again after two and a half years of Zoom and the uh, Microsoft team lectures and meetings, and it's good to see familiar faces and friends. Um, so the ladies in this table are my professors and mentors from UP College of Medicine, and Mayan is uh, one batch lower after me uh, in the vaccinology program in, in Siena. So today I am going to talk about mRNA technology. Uh, you already know the mRNA vaccine, so we will not be talking about the effectiveness um, or safety or vaccination schedule. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that we understand a lot about the RNA biology already. Um, in fact, we know in detail how mRNA is produced, how it is degraded, and actually even to artificially produce it, right? So actually we know a lot about RNA. Um, I just came from a three-day meeting of mRNA science and technology in, in Europe, and I can tell you there's so much to discuss about mRNA, but for a 30-minute lecture, um, I will focus on the most important aspects of science and technology so that you will be able to talk to fellow experts and also non-science, non-medical stakeholders. And hopefully, after the talk, you will have more um, questions. So first of all, some disclosures. Um, I am employed by Clover Biopharma. It's not moving. Um, okay, so which way do I? Oh, this one. Oh, this. Okay. Okay, there you go. Okay. Thanks. So um, some disclosures, I am employed by Clover Biopharma, and I am a technical expert or a consultant in some of these companies listed here, but I am not representing them today. I am representing myself as a physician and a scientist who's been working on vaccines and vaccinology and viruses for over a decade now. Um, so I really divided my talk into three parts, the when, the how, and the why. And I wanted to start with the when did mRNA research start? So we cannot really talk about mRNA without first mentioning the central dogma of biology, right? Um, it is the process by which the instructions in the DNA are transcribed, and then they are um, translated into proteins, basically. And this was discovered in 1958 by um, Francis Crick and James Watson, and um, basically this started the study into mRNAs, DNAs, and proteins. And the story of mRNA actually started in 1961 when Sidney Brenner discovered it, and this is his publication entitled An Unstable Intermediate Carrying Information from Genes to Ribosomes for Protein Synthesis. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? But um, we know then that mRNA is unstable. And Sidney Brenner also actually is the person who discovered the stop codon. So in, in med school, you remember the UAG, UGA, UAA. It's Sidney Brenner who discovered that. And um, a little side note, he was my first non-Asian friend when I was working in Singapore um, in 2007. So I'm basically showing my, my age, but he was my first friend and then he, he he was already a Nobel Prize winner then, but he was a very humble person. And so just a review of molecular biology, RNA and mRNA are two types of nucleic acids mediating protein synthesis in the cell, and both RNA and mRNA contain ribose in uracil, 
but they have different functions. Um, we did not understand this right away in 1961, but in the years following the discovery, things became clearer. And in here, you will see the timeline for the development of the mRNA technology and the science. Um, and you will see that in 1969, it was Jerry Lingwell from the University of Cincinnati who first um, showed that proteins can be produced from isolated mRNA. And then um, John Wolf from the University of Wisconsin um, showed, demonstrated first the translation of mRNA um, into, into mice. And then you will see that after that, there was not much development. And this is because during that time, um, people were not really convinced that mRNA is something that would work. So, walang funding, walang support from NIH. But then, these two people, Drew Weissman and Kathleen Carrico, they were the ones who really persevered and worked on mRNA. And the story is actually very interesting because while Drew Weissman was waiting for the photocopy machine in this university, um, Kathleen Carrico went there as well to photocopy something. And then they discovered, they realized that they both are interested in mRNA. And then their partnership basically started during that conversation in a photocopy machine. And then they pushed through with the development of mRNA. And then here you will see that the first um, study using cancer antigens created with mRNA started in 1995, and then in 1997, the first mRNA company was founded. It's called Merix. It was later renamed Argus Therapeutics, and now it's called Coimmune. And in 1999, the first anti-tumor response from mRNA vaccination was observed. So it was really in the field of immunotherapy and oncology where the mRNA technology started. And then from 2005 to 2013, there were several important discoveries made that really helped the technology mature to what it is today. And in nine, 2018, we had the first um, drug approved by the FDA. Um, Onpatro is used to treat polyneuropathy caused by hereditary transthyretin-mediated amyloidosis. And then in 2005 to 2013, so we, we had several important discoveries from researchers from the University of Mainz in Germany and BioNTech. And basically, they really helped understand how to make more stable mRNAs and really improve the immunostimulatory effects of mRNA. So theoretically, it's quite easy to create mRNAs, right? And then Mayan mentioned that it's, you know, it's sim simpler to manufacture mRNA, which is true. Because really, you have the DNA construct, um, you clone in, for example, an E. coli bacteria. Then you can purify it and amplify, and then the linearized DNA constructs are transcribed. The transcripts are either capped during transcription or post-transcription, and then they are purified by chromatography. So basically, it's quite simple. But then we need to remember that there are coding and non-coding RNAs. And when we talk about the transcriptome or the full range of messenger RNA, um, only about 3% actually of mRNAs are coding mRNAs. So they are the ones that code for proteins. The rest are actually not coding mRNAs. And so this is a typical mRNA construct. You will see here the supporting untranslated regions, the poly A tail. We have an optional signal peptide sequence attached to the coding sequence. So the question now is which ones can you actually modify to improve the mRNA construct? And this is something that the the group in the University of Mines and BioNTech answered, and the answer is you can actually um, modify practically everything to, to change the characteristic of the mRNA. So for example, you can modify the length of the poly A tail to alter the stability. You can also change the coding region to improve translation, or you can change the five cap portion to mediate binding to the translation initiation factor. And then here, um, you will see the different effects of the changes to the parts of the mRNA. So the one on my top right, which is your left, is the original RNA. Beside it, you will see the effect of increasing the half-life of the RNA. And below, you will see the increased translation. And on the bottom, my left and your right, you will see the increased translation and increased half-life 
of, of the mRNA. So now we, we know that it's actually um, a little bit complicated because changes in any part of the mRNA construct will change um, the product. But the complexity does not end there because it has to be enclosed in a lipid nanoparticle composed of phospholipid, cholesterol, ionizable lipid, and pegylated lipids. So how are they produced and how do they work? Here you will see that um, you first need to encode the protein that you want, for example, the, the, the spike protein. Then you package them into lipid nanoparticles. You transport them, of course, in wherever you want the vaccine to be. And then you inject them intramuscularly to the patient in case of the mRNA vaccines we have now. And after injection, the oily capsule containing the spike protein mRNA is taken up by the muscle and some immune cells. And the cellular machinery uses this mRNA as instructions to, to massively produce spike proteins. And as soon as the immune cells recognize these particles as foreign, a, a rapid immune response is initiated. The antigen-presenting cells take up the mRNA and produce the process uh, antigen on MHC1 or MHC2 molecules. And so you have the CD4 and CD8 immune response. And, and so an interesting feature of the mRNA is actually that it is um, very easily degradable in a room temperature. And our cells have sophisticated mechanism to ensure that the mRNA is destroyed after um, promoting protein synthesis. And so the next question that is um, really normal for people to ask is, how do you know that mRNA vaccines will not alter your DNA? So three things. Firstly, mRNA is chemically and structurally different from DNA mRNA is located in a different cellular compo uh, compartment. Um, so mRNA is produced in the nucleus, but it's quickly exported to the cytoplasm with a one-way ticket. So hindi yan babalik. Um, only specific proteins carry nuclear localization signals that can migrate um, back to the nucleus. And last but not the least, RNA molecules are actually um, charged, and they carry the same charge as the nucleus. So um, like charges repel, and the MR RNA molecule is physically repelled by the nucleus. So how are they different from traditional vaccines? You've seen in the slides that Mayan showed earlier that um, the traditional vaccines are um, the inactivated vaccines, uh, live attenuated vaccines, protein subunit, and so on and so forth. And here you will see that, of course, there are similarities, right? Um, in terms of R&D is the same, in terms of what they what you want the vaccine to do, which is to teach the, the body to protect um, your body from pathogens. It's, it's similar, but the components are different. The production is a bit different, and, and the process is, of course, different. And in terms of, for example, quality control, you will see that also um, the processes are a bit different just because the mRNA itself is very easily degradable, as, as what we have mentioned already and we have the lipid particle to protect it from degradation, and that is actually very sensitive to many things like temperature, pH, um, humidity, and so on and so forth. So um, the next question is how can we maximize the use of the mRNA technology? I've mentioned earlier that um, the mRNA science actually really started with immunotherapy and oncology, right? But there is a key difference between how a vaccine would be used to treat um, cancers versus a vaccine that's used for an infectious disease like COVID-19. Firstly, mRNA vaccines um, are prophylactic. Um, but a cancer mRNA vaccine, for example, is an intervention. And what you want to do is to encourage the T cells to, to fight the cancer. So really, the difference is Mainly, the other one is prophylactic, and the other one is immunotherapeutic. But the, the process of creating them are, are similar. And here, um, this is a publication that uh, we did, I think, in 2018. And we were talking here about nucleic acid-based molecules in general. So we are talking about DNA, RNA, aptamers, so on and so forth. And in this review, we showed that um, these 
nucleic acid molecules can have potential applications in cancer, in neurological disorders, cardiovascular um, disorders, inflammatory disorders, and also infectious diseases. And here I will be showing you um, the potential mRNA applications for uh, different uh, for different things in science. So, firstly, for cancer immunotherapy, for infectious diseases, for allergy tolerization, and for protein replacement. These are some of the things that have been done already in preclinical stage. And I am particularly proud of the infectious disease side because for influenza and tuberculosis, something that um, I, I started several years ago um, had supported and had something to do with the, um, the research. So this is a photo of me and um, my other colleagues at the Gates Foundation. This was in 2014. And that's me and uh, Mr. Gates there. Um, and during that time, we created this collaboration for TB vaccine discovery, which was initially just really for TB. But um, what we did here then was actually used for other diseases as well. So for example, the mRNA vaccines by BioNTech, the viral vector vaccine by AstraZeneca, um, they benefited from the non-clinical studies that we did with the uh, rhesus macaques, and those studies were first supported by the collaboration for TB vaccine discovery. And some of these mRNA vaccines are already used um, in clinical trials, so phase one and phase 2A, for example. So we have vaccines for melanoma, for renal cell carcinoma, for prostate cancer, and for infectious diseases, we have in phase one a vaccine for HIV. But it does not end there. Um, they are also used for genome engineering and for genetic programming. So in the preclinical stage, there are studies using engineered mice, engineered rats, engineered rabbits, and engineered macaques. And for genetic reprogramming, there, are, there have been studies in the preclinical stage um, to create transcription factors, to, to create progerin, and progerin is a biomarker used in studying natural aging for modeling of Parkinson's disease, for example. Um, we don't have anything in the clinical stage at the moment, but in the next few years, when we see results of the preclinical studies, I'm sure uh, it will be proceeding to the clinical stage. And so this is just a, a summary of what I've mentioned so far. Um, these are all the many potential applications of the mRNA technology. So you will see here that this technology is really something that's very promising that will most probably change science in the next few years and will most probably change the way we create vaccines or even therapies for several diseases. And so um, the last part of my talk is really to, to ask why can't everyone just make mRNA vaccines? And this is the most interesting part, I would say. Um, if you look at how they are made, it seems easy, it seems fast, but it's really the vaccine design and the mRNA production stage that's very difficult. As I've mentioned, you can change any part of the mRNA construct and then you will have a different product. Basically, the process is very important. And maybe you've heard that there were other mRNA vaccine candidates that were not successful. So we know about Pfizer, we know about Moderna, but we've also heard about CureVac, right? CureVac was not successful. There are others that didn't even move to the clinical stage. And this is because any part of the mRNA construct that you change will have a big, uh, significant change in the result of the immune response or the safety as well. And here you will see that the real challenge is really characterizing your mRNA product. Um, you have to characterize the purity. You have to be careful in identifying the sequence. You have to make sure that the poly A tail and length of the poly A tail is optimal. Um, also, the capping efficiency is also a big factor. Of course, the product and the process, I've mentioned that. But the other thing is number six and seven, the residual DNA template is also very important, and the double-stranded RNA contamination is also important. And then 
what I want to just emphasize here is that not all mRNAs are created equally. So the last question is why don't we have our own vaccine manufacturers? And this is a very good question for everyone here because I think we want to know why, right? Yes, so um, I wanted to just show you that Indonesia has their own mRNA COVID vaccine now. Um, it's a collaboration with Etana. And also here that African, the South African mRNA hub is in, in Cape Town, it's existing. Um, they have started their animal studies and hopefully they will do their clinical studies next year. Um, in Thailand, they, they are targeting to create their own mRNA vaccine. So, okay, so this says here by the end of the year, but this is an old um, article and this is delayed of course, so it's not gonna be this end of this year, but probably next year. Um, this is a map of all the vaccine manufacturers in low and middle income countries. So you will see here that there are 4 to 1 manufacturers from 14 countries and territories all over the world. So there are companies in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, and um, Philippines is not there, of course, right? So I wanted to show you the, the 10 countries in ASEAN region. Um, just to emphasize that it's not about the money, because we're actually not poor, right? We are number three in terms of GDP. And all these countries here, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, Malaysia, they have their own vaccine manufacturers. And even some of them, like Vietnam has four, for example, right? So um, here I will show you that there is this mRNA technology transfer hub that's been created by WHO and many other partners. And basically what they wanted to do is to make sure that in every part of the world, well not in all countries, but in every region, there will be a mRNA production hub. And this is because we know that this will not be the last pandemic. Maybe not, maybe not in our lifetimes, but in the future there will be other pandemics. And for that, we need to be ready. So you can actually have an mRNA production capacity if you apply to this mRNA technology hub in South Africa. Um, and there are two parts for that. First is the inception stage where, of course, you define what you wanna do, you secure the funding, and then the implementation stage talks about the R&D, human capital, and then, of course, the proper vaccine technology transfer. So this, is, this has been done in the past, not just for mRNA, we know that, for example, um, Butantan in, in, in Brazil, or what else, um, in Vietnam, they, they have done technology transfers for flu vaccines, for example. So I, I just wanted to emphasize that this is something that can be done, actually, if we really want to do it, if we have the financial support, if we have the human capital resource, and if we have the political will to actually make it happen. And so on that note, I think I wanted to end uh, by just emphasizing the, um, the summary of my talk, basically, that mRNA technology is not new. It started in the 1960s, and it even matured in, the, in 2005. Just for us to remember that the central dogma of molecular biology is we have DNA transcribed into RNA, translated into proteins, but not all mRNAs are created equal because you change any part of the mRNA construct and then you will have a different product. And last but not the least, low and middle income countries can actually have mRNA tech transfer. So at the moment, um, Indonesia is part of this, um, Vietnam is also part of this, South Africa, Senegal, and it's not about the money, but it's about the willingness and the support of people and the government. And so, um, I hope you would have questions. Um, we can discuss after this talk, but I will end with uh, this book that I've actually co-edited and authored. Um, this um, includes many aspects of COVID, um, clinical management, vaccines, immunology, and I, I promise the publisher to show it every time I give a lecture. So that's, that's what I'm doing. Okay, so thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, sir. That was a very comprehensive lecture.